Well, today we are continuing on in our sermon series as we are looking at some primarily Old Testament women who were faithful women, incredible women, who followed God's vision for their lives. And if you want, turn with me into your Bibles. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 25 today. Uh, I think I'll exclusively stay in there. I don't think I have any other references other than out of 1 Samuel 25. Um, So grab a Bible. There's some in the pews below. There's also um, iPhones, iPads. If you don't have an electronic app, the Uversion app is a really good app if you're looking for something to use on your phone electronically. You can also go online on your computer and go to, uh, go to that and, and use the Bible online. Pretty neat program. So lots of ways to do that. So grab a Bible if you don't have one and buckle in because today we are digging into the story of Abigail. If you were here for Vacation Bible School, we did cover this on day five. So you got a little bit of a jump start on it, but that's okay. I'll tell it a little bit differently than we told it there. But it's the story of Abigail. And Abigail is married to a man by the name of Nabal. And, and his name, Nabal, literally translates to the word fool. Okay? He's a fool. And not only that, he's evil and he's harsh. But especially, Nabal is a fool. Now, we need to realize that that, that a fool is not necessarily someone who's stupid, right? Uh, One simple definition of fool might be one who does not recognize the obvious. Now, I was reading this week and, and I read this story about a couple who were off attending a marriage seminar. They were, they were at the seminar, and the seminar was specifically about how to better communicate in your marriage. Any of us got need that? Yeah. I think we get better at that, right? So they go to this marriage seminar about how to better communicate with one another. And while they were sitting there listening to the instructor, the instructor said, it is essential that husbands and wives know one another's likes and dislikes. And then the instructor looked at this couple and he said, Tom, Tom, why don't you tell the class here, what is your wife's favorite flower? Tom reached over and patted his wife on the arm and nodded knowingly and he looked at her and gently said, it's Pillsbury, isn't it, honey? (laughs) Now, as bad as that answer was, Abigail's husband was worse. And as we will see, it's plain and simple to see he was mean, he was ungrateful, and he was a fool. Nobody knows exactly how it came to be that this person we're going to celebrate today, Abigail, how, how did this very faithful woman of the Lord, how did this great woman become married to this imbecile, this fool, right? But in spite of that handicap, Abigail was a woman who showed great character and tremendous wisdom. And, and all we know that about her is summed up in this one simple chapter in 1 Samuel. Yet she comes through as one of the most notable people, one of the most notable women for certain in all of the Old Testament. And as we study Abigail, I think you will soon begin to appreciate her decisiveness, her sensitivity, her respect for others, and her patience. And as it is with all of the characters in the Bible, good or bad, their stories are recorded here for us in Scripture for a purpose, primarily for our own learning. Now, the setting for 1 Samuel 25, we are back at the time of David, but before David was king. Samuel the prophet has just died, and David has not yet become the next king of Israel. Instead, this comes during the time period where David is being chased, David is being harrowed, David is being persecuted by the current king, good old King Saul. King Saul is trying to hunt him down, because he is insanely jealous over David's popularity. David, you see, David had had some great military conquests. He had incredible success. He was a great leader of men, particularly in war. And and everything he touched seemed to turn to gold, so to speak, as far as war goes. And so he comes back after these great battles that he's won, and everybody's singing his praises. You go to the bars, you go to the taverns, they're all singing about David. And the king's going, what about me? Why aren't they singing about me? I'm the king. I'm the one who told David to go there. Why don't I get the credit? And he's jealous, right? And Saul is jealous and he has contempt for David. And it grows and it festers and and it continues to the point at which 
Saul ends up trying to kill David. And David is the best friend of Saul's son, Jonathan. So you know things have gotten pretty bad. So by the time that we get to this chapter, David and about 600 of his men, they are on the run and they're trying to escape the sword of Saul. David is one of the three primary characters in this passage. The other two, as I mentioned, are obviously Abigail and her husband Nabal. Uh, Let's dive in in 1 Samuel 25, starting in verses 2 through 4, to help us get introduced to this couple who are the complete opposite in their character. And there it says, A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. You see, he had a thousand goats, and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot necessarily, but that's a huge amount. Back in the day before you had a bank, you put your wealth in cattle because you get interest from cattle, right? They will multiply, they will divide, and they will make more. That makes you more money. And so he's got 1,000 goats, 3,000 sheep, and it's shearing time. And it says his name was Nabal and his wife's name was Abigail. She was intelligent. She was beautiful. But her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings, right? While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So, so Nabal's a rich guy, right? Nabal has money. He's a wealthy rancher, and he's a Calebite, which means he's a descendant of Caleb. But he's evil. He's harsh, Right? In verse 17, if you skipped ahead a few verses, even in his own household, it says, out of his own household, it says these words, he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. And this is the guy who's married to Abigail. Contrast that with Abigail, who who not only was intelligent, it said, right? But she's beautiful, right? You get the picture? We've got a beauty and the beast story going on in the Bible. We we got a winner married to a loser. Verse 4 tells us that David, he hears that Nabal was shearing sheep. What does that matter, right? Why is that important? Well, David and his 600 men, they're on the run. They've been living off the land now for, at the very least, several weeks. And and while they were doing that, they've actually been out guarding 3,000 of the sheep that Nabal owns. Now, you need to know that it was customary in these times when somebody guards your sheep for several weeks, when sheep shearing time comes, you compensate them a little bit, right? You give them a little thanks. It wasn't mandatory, it's, it's, but it's the ethical thing to do. It's kind of like tipping in our, in our American culture, right? You're not required to tip when you go out to the restaurant, but it's kind of the right thing to do. And I say that. I waited tables for 10 years of my life. Tip well, folks. Tip well. <laughs> Okay, um, if you're going to leave a tract, double whatever you're tipping. I'm serious about that. When I was a, this is way off topic. When I was a waiter, I used to buy those tracts from my coworkers because very frequently people who left those tracts didn't leave a tip, and I would pay my coworkers for those tracts so they weren't stiffed because I felt bad that a Christian would do that to them. So, an aside, it's another bonus for the day. Tip well. Okay. So it wasn't mandatory that that Nabal would give them this stuff, but it was kind of expected. It's part of the culture. It's generally expected. So what does David do? When shearing time comes, David sends 10 of his guys down to meet Nabal at his house. So let's pick up the story again in verse 6. David says to his guys, he says, Say to Nabal, say to him, Long life to you, right? Nice greeting. Good health to you and your household. Good health to all. All that is yours, right? Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. And when your shepherds were with us, we didn't mistreat them. And the whole time that they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. You can even ask your own servants, David says, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my young men. Since we come at this festive time, please, please, just just give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. So can you see the plot unfolding here? 
David and his men have been helping guard Nabal's massive flock of sheep, and they've done a superb job of it. Not a single sheep goes missing. Nothing disappears. Everything's taken care of. No wolves get it. Nobody steals sheep. They were the men on the job. So, as was the custom, upon learning that Nabal's about to shear the sheep, which means he's going to come into a whole bunch of money. When you get that wool off, you go sell that wool, cash comes flowing in. So David says, uh, uh, let's send 10 guys down to Nabal to collect our tip, right? Now, what do you think Nabal's response to this request is going to be? Let me summarize the next few verses for you. Nabal was a jerk. That's the summary. He acted rudely. He refused hospitality to David and his men. Nabal acted like uh, the stubborn, greedy grump that he was. Nabal wasn't just unkind and mean. He also wasn't very smart about this. He was a fool. His reply is not the type of thing that you say to 600 armed fighting men who are on the run for their very lives, who have performed an outstanding service for you, who are out in the woods, probably eating locusts and whatever they can get their hands on. They're hungry. That's not the kind of response you send to a guy like that. I can't give you any food. Nah, nah forage for yourselves, right? And these guys were starving. So David and his men, they get on their horses and they ride, to, they, they're planning at least to ride to Nabal's house to administer some old western kind of justice, some ancient desert kind of justice. They are going to go into his house and they're going to kill Nabal and all of his household, the Bible tells us. This drastic action wasn't typical of David, of course. But, I mean, David would normally inquire of the Lord before taking action. But he responds with a quick temper in this particular story. He lets his temper get a hold of him. And so with this serious confrontation looming, it would appear the story needs a cool, level-headed person to intercede. Somebody to come in, an intelligent hero to come in and save the day. And this is where Abigail enters the story. One of Nabal's servants, I'm not sure who, but one of Nabal's servants saw what happened. He, he was there when the ten guys come into town and they ask for the little bit of food from Nabal, Nabal and he sees their faces change when Nabal insults them. And off they go. So this servant knows, uh-oh, Something bad's about to go down. So wisely, the servant goes to Abigail. This servant asks Abigail to think things over, it says in Scripture, and see what she can do. Because Nabal, he's not going to listen to anybody. No point in this servant going to talk to Nabal. Now before we look at what Abigail decides to do, let me ask you something. If you were in Abigail's shoes, what would you have done? And now remember this. She's locked into a bad marriage, right? One commentator I read this week said that she's as if she's a princess married to a toad. I mean, he's a greedy, no good, just foolish slimeball of a man. I mean, I wonder how many people, given the exact same situation today, simply would have just packed up their bags and left and let David end the marriage for him. Right? Take the easy way out. She could have packed her bags and hit the road. Then her problems would have been solved, at least to some degree. Well, let's see what she did. Verses 18 and 19 of 1 Samuel 25. It says, Abigail lost no time. She took up 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sheaves of uh, of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisin, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, Go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. The next few verses remind us that David had planned on killing Nabal and his family because of the way that Nabal had treated David and his men. Moving down to verses 23 and 24, it says, When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off of her donkey and she bowed down before David with her face to the ground, it says. She fell at his feet. She said, My Lord... Let the blame be upon me and on me alone, she says. Please let your servant speak to you. Hear 
what your humble servant here has to say. Now I think here we get a a clue as to what at first attracted David to Abigail. As we go on with the rest of Abigail's story, we are going to see some things about her that we can all use as we, we serve the Lord as well as others. And the first thing that we see is that Abigail was a woman of respect. It was the custom of the day to bow down before a visitor as a sign of respect. And that is exactly what Abigail does when she comes upon David. But her respect for David also has to do with who he is, right? Let's pick the story up again in verse 28. As Abigail continues speaking with David, she says, Please, please forgive your servant's offense. For the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master, because he, meaning David, you, fight the Lord's battles. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live. 29. Even though someone is pursuing you take, to take your life, the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he has promised concerning him and has appointed him the leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord has brought my master success, that means you again, David, remember your servant. So Abigail shows respect for both David and God here. But she also indirectly is showing respect for her husband, the fool, by not saying, David, I don't agree with all those things my terrible husband is doing. She doesn't say that. She doesn't throw him under the bus. She doesn't say, David, he's a fool. Please don't hold it against me. Right? That's not what she says. She could have easily said, hey, look, I've brought you food. I've brought you supplies. Go ahead and get him. Just leave me be. Right? That would have been the easy way. But instead, she chooses the honorable way to deal with it respectfully. The second thing to notice about Abigail is that she was a woman willing to sacrifice. Verse 18 says this, and I read that, but I'll say it again. It says, Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, the dressed sheep, the grain, the cakes, all this stuff, loads them on donkeys and hits the road immediately. And then look at verse 24 closely. Verse 24, notice the phrase. She says, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt Later in the first part of verse 28, she basically says the same thing. She says, please forgive the trespass of your servant. Can you see Abigail's humble attitude here? Abigail, you see, she was willing to accept the blame for her husband's foolish actions. She was willing to suffer any consequences that might come with that blame, even though she had no part in it. Whenever we read about the heroes of the faith, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, they are, they're, they're just always people with this humble spirit, which I believe enables them to sacrifice for the benefit of others, even for those who might mistreat them. Like Jesus, right? So Abigail was a woman of respect, a woman willing to sacrifice. And third, she was a woman totally committed to her relationships. Look again at 26 and 27. It says, Now since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm my master be like Nabal. And let this gift, which your servant has brought to my master, be given to the men who follow you. If any woman ever had good reason not to support her husband, One could make a very strong argument for Abigail, right? I mean, after all, he wasn't even meeting her halfway in the marriage, right? He wasn't meeting her at all. There was no give and take here. There there was no compromise for them. It was just his way, and that's the way it was going to be. But as we have seen, Abigail was willing to still take the blame for his shortcomings. 
even though she would acknowledge his foolish behavior, she didn't ask David to go ahead and kill Nabal and save her. And I believe Abigail was following the teaching that's found in Proverbs 32, 10 through 12, where it says, An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all of the days of her life. Abigail stands as a strong example for us today. She did her husband good, even though he didn't deserve it. Another thing I want you to see here is that, just like this story, God can work in your life, even in bad situations. Abigail's plan worked. David calls off his invasion. If you're still following, look at verses 34 and 35, where David is responding to all that Abigail has said to him. David says this. He says, Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you? If you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what it was that she had brought to him, and he said to her, Abigail, go home in peace. I have heard your words, and I have granted your request. We can only speculate as to how strong Abigail's prayer life and commitment to worshiping the Lord actually was. But nonetheless, given what we have, I think it is safe to assume that she had a fairly strong relationship with God. I believe that Abigail used her relationship with God as a means of support in helping her survive this relationship day to day. God was there when her husband wasn't. And like Abigail, we too should learn to lean upon God, using him to help us survive our daily struggles. From our text, I gather that that Abigail was never able to change her husband. In fact, after all that Abigail has been through, as the story continues on, if you don't know the ending of the story, she goes home to her husband, Nabal. You know how she finds him? He's drunk. Verse 36, Nabal's drunk. She shows up home having just saved his hide. He's drunk. Isn't that fitting? The fool is drunk. And Abigail tells him, she goes into Nabal and she tells him, honey, this is what I just did. Right? And he has like some kind of heart attack, it would appear, as she's telling him. He's like, you gave away what? What? Red Sanford, right? It's the big one. And in fact, this was the big one. Because ten days later, he's dead. Because the Lord struck him down. So now she's free. But not only that, the Bible continues to tell us that Abigail... Did you know this? Abigail ends up marrying David. Her once unhappy situation becomes a very happy one, right? The key is Abigail didn't allow her situation to affect her faith. And she trusts God to continue to work on her life. Folks, Abigail stands as an incredibly strong example for each and every one of us. She had a bad marriage situation that led to a potentially bad home situation, but she never gave up. And eventually, God blessed her because of her great faith. Her story gives us some incredibly valuable lessons, especially to anyone who might be struggling in a relationship today. What are you struggling with today? Where have maybe you been faithful, wondering if God has a plan for whatever it is you're going through? I'm here to tell you, He does. And sometimes, like Abigail, we must endure and must remain faithful. But do so, folks, knowing that God is in it and he has a plan for it and he hasn't abandoned you and he hasn't forgotten you. Remain humble, prayerful, faithful, and see what incredible things God can do. You do that? Amen. Let's pray.